Praise be Jesus and Mary. Amen. Today we Franciscans of the Immaculate have the privilege of celebrating the Feast of the Queenship of Mary. In Latin, the titles King and Queen, Rex and Regina, they come from the same Latin ver verb regere, which means to order and guide things to their proper end. St. Thomas Aquinas understood that definition. He understood a lot of things. And so he said that the ones who are called king and queen have the office or the duty to rule, to govern, to guide society to its proper end, to the purpose for its existence. One of the main duties or occupations of Jesus and Mary is to guide souls to their proper end, too, to help them reach their perfection and the purpose of their life. What's our purpose in life? Nothing less than to know, love, and serve God in this life and to be happy with Him in the next, as the old but good Baltimore Catechism teaches. The corresponding title in Latin for king is Dominus, which means Lord. For queen, it's Domina, which means Lady. This is why we call Jesus our Lord and why we call Mary our Lady. It's another way of saying, He's my king and she is my queen. Even when we pray the Our Father prayer, what do we pray? We pray, Father, thy kingdom come. The kingdom of the Heavenly Father is nothing less than the kingdom ruled by his son and by his son's mother. We need to be careful because to reject the one or the other, to reject the son or the mother, is essentially to reject the kingdom itself. That rejection of the kingdom was the sin which caused the greatest of the angels to fall into eternal misery. Yes, Satan fell because of pride, but it was a pride which refused to serve the incarnate king and his royal mother. We heard in today's gospel another angel, a good angel this time, say to Mary, the Lord will give him, meaning your son, the throne of his father David. And he will rule over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Luke 1, verses 32 and 33. In the Davidic kingdom, we see this especially under the kingdom, the kingship of Solomon. In the Davidic kingdom, it was the king's mother, not his wife, who was queen. Solomon may have had 500 brides, but he had only one mother, and it was Bathsheba his mother who sat at his right as sovereign. At your right stands the queen in gold of Ophir, says the psalmist in Psalm 45, verse 9. And this royal, royal wedding psalm finds its fulfillment in Christ and in Mary. Even St. Elizabeth at the visitation affirmed the queenship of Our Lady when she asked, Why is this granted to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? Luke 1, 43 the mother of my Lord. So Elizabeth knows what she's saying about Mary. She's saying, how is it that I'm so honored to have my own queen in my own house? Origen, about 200 years or so after Christ's birth, reading those words of Elizabeth concluded, he said, since Mary is the mother of the sovereign king of the universe, therefore she's also my lady and my sovereign, said Origen. Everything that Jesus has that he can share with his mother, he does. And Mary participates in the functions of her son in the manner and in the degree which is consonant, which is in agreement with her own nature. Jesus Christ is king by nature, by divine right, and by conquest. By conquest, why? Because he's the redeemer. Mary is also queen by nature being the mother of the king, by divine right, meaning by the eternal decree of God, and also by conquest, since she is the co-redeemer, the co-redemptrix. Both of them fought, bought, and paid for all of us on Calvary. So the theological basis for Mary's queenship is threefold. One, her status as the mother of the king. Two, her mission as associate of Christ in the redemption. And three, her spiritual maternity. She is the new Eve, the new mother of all the living, especially all of those who are alive in Christ. 
We even see her queenship in the last book of Scripture, too, in the book of Revelation, chapter 12, where there's a complete antagonism and total conflict between the woman and her child and the dragon, who is Satan. The woman who is, quote, clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and a crown of 12 stars on her head, that's Revelation 12, 1. Those symbols represent her dominion over the heavens and over the earth, and actually over the church as well. The 12 stars represent the 12 apostles, as well as the 12 tribes of Israel. So in Revelation, there's a true king and queen and their armies battling against the usurper of the throne, the devil, called by our Lord, the prince of this world, in John chapters 12, 14, and 16. So the, there's the legitimate king and queen fighting the illegitimate prince for primacy in the universe. And the two of them together, king and queen, crush the head of the ancient serpent. So it's again, victory by conquest, not just by mere privilege or by right. And it was also a victory through death as well. As the biblical scholar Brand Petrie points out, the serpent strikes at the heel of the son and of the woman. We read that in the NAB translation of Genesis 3.15. So if a poisonous serpent bites your heel, what happens to you? You're gonna die from that. Calvary was the place where Jesus and Mary died. The one physically died for us. The other one, the queen, spiritually or mystically died for all of us as well. But it was the death of the king and the queen on Calvary that gave life to all of us too. Even the oldest image of Our Lady that we have, a second century painting of the adoration of the Magi on the walls of one of the catacombs in Rome, the catacomb of St. Priscilla. Even in that image, historians say that Mary is represented with a hairstyle which was similar to the Roman empresses of the time, so the first part of the second century. In another painting in the same catacomb from the, from, the, from the same time, essentially, Our Lady is holding Jesus again in her arms, this time with the prophet Balaam standing next to them. Balaam's actually pointing to a star over Our Lady's head in that picture, in that painting. We read Balaam's prophecy of the star in Numbers 24, which is a prophecy of Christ, as St. Jerome notes. But the star has another reference as well, too. Those of you who know your Bibles, or at least know some of the stories in the Bible, right? The Jewish queen Esther in the Old Testament, the name Esther means star. And we see that star on the statues of Our Lady of Fatima very often as well, a little, little yellow golden star. Mary, our queen, is the new Esther. She's the one who intercedes for us and implores mercy for us before the throne of her son, the king. And already in the Christian writings of the fourth century, we hear of them referring to Mary by that title Domina, which means lady, which again means queen or sovereign. From a devotional point of view, however, we could be inclined to side with St. Therese of the Child Jesus, who says that Mary is more, more mother than queen, said St. Therese. Anyone familiar with Our Lady's motherly care easily relates to her as a child relates to a loving mother, more so than a subject would relate to a queen. We relate to Our Lady more as a child to a mother, more so than as a subject to a queen. This ties into the last theological biblical principle, which we'll note regarding Mary's queenship today. Jesus, a number of times, perhaps a half a dozen or so times in the Gospels, teaches what true greatness is. He says, he who is greatest among you shall be your servant. Matthew 23, verse 11. And again, he said, if anyone would be first, he must be the last of all and the servant of all. Mark 9, 35. We heard in today's gospel how Our Lady calls herself what the handmaid or the servant of the Lord, Luke 1, 38. So the one, one of the humbler aspects of Mary's queenship is that she's also the greatest servant in the kingdom of God. 
was thinking about it, if you go to a store or a fast food place, people working there will typically ask you, you know, how can I help you or what can I do for you? It's the same question that Our Lady addresses to us as well. How can I help you today? Our Queen has a servant's heart. She has a heart of gold. She really has a heart for you, especially. Pope Pius XII, in his encyclical on the Queenship of Mary ad Celi Reginam, he opens the encyclical saying this. He said, from the earliest ages of the Church, a Christian people, whether in time of triumph or more especially in time of crisis, has addressed prayers of petition and hymns of praise and veneration to the Queen of Heaven, and never has that hope wavered, which they placed in the mother of the divine King, Jesus Christ. Nor has that faith ever failed by which we are taught that Mary, the Virgin Mother of God, reigns with a motherly solicitude over the entire world, just as she is crowned in heavenly blessedness with the glory of a queen, says Pius XII. So the motherly solicitude and care of Our Lady for us should help us to turn to her with love, with confidence, and to turn to her often as well, asking for help, asking for guidance, asking for protection, asking for advice, asking for all the graces that she and her son acquired for us on Calvary. And we'll close with the exhortation of St. Bernard of Clairvaux, which we mentioned the other day, his memorial we celebrated two days ago on Saturday. We'll close with his invocation to our queen, which we shared on this past Saturday. In danger, said St. Bernard, in distress, in uncertainty, think of Mary, call upon Mary. She never leaves your lips, she never departs from your heart. And so that you may obtain the help of her prayers, never forget the example of her life. If you follow her, you cannot falter. If you pray to her, you cannot despair. If you think of her, you cannot err. If she sustains you, you will never stumble. If she protects you, you have nothing to fear. If she guides you, you will never flag. If she's favorable to you, you will attain your goal. Praise be Jesus and Mary, now and forever.